What a terrific year we've had to explore the Fallout games for the less talked about bits. The suggestions from the YouTube comments and the Discord server have been an absolute blast to look into. The channel would be nothing without all of you that come out to watch the videos. I want to thank all the viewers and fans watching. 2021 was an excellent year for the channel and I can't express the gratitude I feel for each of you. I hope you all had a good 2021 and I can't wait to see what next year brings us, like Starfield. For now, this is the 60 most popular Fallout facts from 2021. A member of my Discord pointed out an easter egg that YouTuber Bears798 had found, linked to their videos in the description. At the Galaxy News Radio Plaza in Fallout 3, you can find this sculpture of a rocket ship orbiting the globe. This is a reference to Interplay, the creators of the Fallout series, and their opening scene that shows the same logo. This is made more apparent and matches more closely in the Capital Wasteland Creation Club add-on for Fallout 4, which features the same easter egg but modified to have one ring around it, like the original Interplay logo. This is a terrific small shout out to the original creators of the series that Bethesda decided to pay homage to in a beautiful way. In Fallout New Vegas, when visiting the Strip, we can find the Ultralux Casino, considered one of the fanciest establishments in the entire wasteland. However, very few people notice the note camouflage by the sidewalk texture just outside the venue. The letter, entitled Fine Dining, reads as follows. These past few years, the very idea of fine dining has seemed beyond our grasp. Indeed, where does one even begin to look for something artfully prepared and beautifully presented by a world-class chef? Well, fellow epicures, I have found the one place left on this godforsaken earth with real food. I present to you the Ultralux. Ignore the rabble on the street, the petty farmers and the everyman types rubbing their pitiful few caps together in an attempt to elevate themselves to some semblance of class. Ignore the filthy, disease-written prostitutes of the Gomorrah, whoring themselves to anyone with coin. Walk briskly to the fabulous Ultralux, the only building in New Vegas worth your attention. You'll know it when you see it. Enter the doors of their restaurant, the Gourmand, and speak with the lovely Marjorie. She'll arrange for your care. Dally not, for reservations must be made as early as possible. A sumptuous feast awaits you, dear friends. Knowing what we do about the White Glove Society, this note actually gives a great introduction to their faction before we even step through the door. This was suggested by Nasser on the Discord. He had a message for his friend as well, which was, Come to Brazil, Brett. In Fallout New Vegas, one of the factions we can interact with is the Great Cons. If you establish a good relationship with them and then travel to Nelson, you can kick off a line of events that can make you the absolute leader of the tribe. Speaking with Dead Sea, we can get a quest to attack Camp Forlorn Hope. All we have to do is take out all the officers at the camp and return to Dead Sea. Once that is completed, we have to head to Red Rock Canyon. Speaking with Papa Khan, he will be so impressed with what we did that he will name the courier his heir in the cons, making you next in line for leadership. Now all we have to do is take out Papa Khan silently, and the tribe is ours. Speaking with Regis, we can even decide the future of the Great Khans. There is an option to fight everyone, sending them to fight it out against both factions at the dam if we so wish. This is another way to quickly get the Khans to side with the NCR as well. Well, that's the More. end of that. The story of Fallout New Vegas follows the courier after they get shot in the head by Benny Gecko while en route to deliver the platinum chip to Mr. House. If the player chooses to be female and sleeps with Benny, they will be given a love note that may imply a hidden foot fetish that Benny has. The note, called Thanks Baby, reads as follows. Pussycat, thanks for showing this cat the best hey hey he's ever ever. Talk about platinum in the sack, toots. Where'd you learn that 18 karat trick with the heels of your feet? You didn't just make my toes curl, they popped off and rolled under the bed. I wish I could stay for another round, but this gent's got places to be, things to do. You showing up has forced my hand, baby. The time to act is now. I won't be around for a while, but if everything works out right, you and me are a date, got it? Wouldn't miss it for all the caps in Vegas. Now don't get clingy and try following me. Ciao, Benny. In Fallout New Vegas, inside Sloan, we can meet Snuffles, the mole rat with the busted leg. But we will be focusing on a fun fact about a different part of his body in this video. It has always been a fun little factoid that Snuffles actually has a higher intelligence stat than Caesar, with Snuffles the mole rat maintaining a solid 5 intelligence, and the infamous leader of Caesar's legion holding firm at 4 for the stat. Some would argue this is because Caesar has a brain tumor. I think it's just because Snuffles is a genius. 
Big thanks to Nasser on the Discord for suggesting this one. In Fallout New Vegas, you will meet the Boomers at Nellis Air Force Base. Their primary focus at the moment is raising the Lady in the Water, a crashed B-29 bomber that is on the surface of Lake Mead. Going through the quest Volare, we'll see the courier use inflation devices to raise it from the lake, and Loyal will state that the Boomers are sending robots to clean up the parts. As we can see beforehand, the Boomers already have a bomber in their hangar, but this one was found in the old museum and they can only use it for parts. The one in Lake Mead is pretty much entirely intact. After some time in game, we can see the Boomers repairing the plane to complete working order, something a lot of people miss because very few come back to Nellis after helping the Boomers. Another small detail that doesn't have to be in the game, but makes the world have that much more depth. You gotta love things like this. This was suggested by Max on the Discord. In Fallout 3, we start our adventure around the time James, our father, leaves Vault 101, plunging the entire community into chaos and putting everyone in danger in the process. Amada will wake us up to tell us about what has just happened and ultimately offer the Lone Wanderer a 10mm pistol. Most people aren't going to turn down a free gun at the start of the game, so you likely took it for yourself. This leads to Amada being terrorized by her father, the Overseer, and a Vault Guard. Probably nothing, which is why you need to tell me where he is, so I can talk to him. Go ahead, officer. You need to learn some respect. Stop it! If, however, you choose to refuse the pistol, claiming Amada will likely need it more than you do, this scene changes, and Amada isn't the pushover she once was. What does he have to do with any of this anyway? Probably nothing, which is why you need to tell me where he is so I can talk to him. Watch out, sir, she's got a gun. Amada, where did you get that gun? Just get away from me. I don't want to shoot you, but I will. I swear I will. How dare you threaten me? And with my own gun. I'm your father, damn you, if you show me some respect. Officer Mack, don't just stand there. Don't make me take that gun away from you, girly. Just hand it over. Nice and easy now. No, no! Get away from me! Oh my god, Amata! What have you done? In Fallout Brotherhood of Steel, we can meet a familiar character. This wasteland stranger found in the bar in Carbon, Texas is none other than the vault dweller from the original Fallout. It's proven he is the dweller from Vault 13 when he gives you a quest to retrieve his trusty Vault 13 canteen. He is apparently between the age of 63 and 82 in the game. While I like this insert for a bit of fan service, in my opinion, they completely ruin whatever nuance the player character from Fallout had by giving him the personality of a shallow action movie star. I'm a stranger, girl. Didn't your folks teach you not to talk to strangers? No. You never knew your folks. You're a child of the bomb, raised by rats, adopted by the noble knights of the Brotherhood. If you said that to me 30 years ago, I'd have shot you and sold your gear for drinking money. But I'm too old for that stuff now. Let me buy you a drink. Just got into town myself. I haven't seen anyone from the Brotherhood. Except yourself. I used to be in the Brotherhood too. Well, that was a long time ago. Raiders. I've killed hundreds of them, and more keep popping up. As long as there are humans, there'll be raiders around to cause trouble. That hole? Don't know much about it, and I'm not interested in poking around down there. I've spent enough of my life underground. The mayor? Either he's as stupid as he looks or he's lying to you. There's no vaults around here, kid. Believe me, I'd know. In Fallout New Vegas, you are dug out of a shallow grave by Victor and treated by Doc Mitchell in Good Springs. Doc will have you go through a few different tutorials as you build your character, but have you ever noticed the hidden one involving the Brahmin Skull? Walking over to the fireplace and using the grab command, pushing in the right stick on consoles and the Z key on PC, will issue the prompt for this cut part of the tutorial. This is a small detail that is easy to miss for both new and veteran players of New Vegas, as most would see you can't loot it and move on. This has been suggested by many people on Discord and in the YouTube comments, but most recently by PZEZ23. 
In Fallout New Vegas, we can come across many small details and exciting discoveries that really tie the game world together. One such location is the unmarked Deathclaw Promontory on the east side of the river, across from a prospector's camp. Here, we can find all of the Deathclaws New Vegas has been hiding from us, and if you thought Quarry Junction was rough, this place is like the hard mode version of that area. No place to hide mixed with tight valleys make this peninsula a literal death trap. But if you can manage the death claws, there is quite the reward waiting for you. We can find two prospectors here, each wearing power armor, with one wearing quite possibly the best and rarest in the game. The Enclave Remnant's power armor can be looted, and if you have the power armor training perk, it's yours to wear. With the OP jury rigging perk, you can even repair this armor with the T-51B you find here. But now we have to find the helmet to make this complete. That journey will bring us to Silver Peak Mine, which lies on the road to Jacobstown and is pretty close to the Remnant's bunker itself. This place is no walk in the park either as the mine is dark and filled with the shadows and noises of Cazadores, which will make short work of any explorer foolish enough to breach the entrance. After working our way through the flying killing machines, we can find an unlocked gate that will have the helmet we are looking for lying next to the skeleton of an assumed Enclave member who spent their last days here. Looting it, we can use jury rigging again to repair the helmet with the T-51B piece that we found at the promontory. And now, we are rocking the best armor in the game, at least in my opinion. This is not the only way to get this armor set in the game either, but it certainly is the fastest as Arcade's quest can take quite some time, and the Remnants will only really have this towards the end game. An interesting fact about the Enclave Remnants armor is that game director Joshua Sawyer had planned to make every NPC in the game hostile to the player if they were wearing this, taking from the Fallout 2 story of the Enclave being vilified by most everyone in the area. I imagine this would involve people being surprised to see a set of this armor out in the wild. This was cut and changed because Sawyer believed it took away from the player's experience in-game, and I can see why. But it would be a fun trade-off. Either way, to me, this is the most iconic armor in the Fallout series, being modeled after the advanced power armor from Fallout 2. Not only is it great to see it in Fallout New Vegas, but it's a must-have for item collectors in any playthrough. One of the first things people with even a passing knowledge of the Fallout series will pick up on is that bottle caps have become the main currency of the wasteland. But why is that? In the original Fallout game, bottle caps made much more sense. Also known as hub bucks due to the hub being their point of origin, the hub merchants picked these caps as a currency due to the overall scarcity and the lack of material required to counterfeit them believably. In this first Fallout game, these bottle caps are backed by water merchants in the hub, giving them a central value as everyone wants purified water. This means that everywhere you go, they will accept the caps for a reason. By the time we hit Fallout 2, the NCR has introduced minted coinage, making bottle caps utterly obsolete as a currency. You can find a bag of 10,000 caps in a well at Broken Hills as part of Typhon's treasure quest. These are worth nothing. In Fallout 3, we see a return to caps as a currency. Unlike the original Fallout, these caps seem to be backed by no one and do not really make any sense as a form of money. Though overall, I understand and like this decision. It's nice to have a recognizable currency in the Fallout series, and bottle caps work well. Following the trend from Fallout 3, no doubt, New Vegas also has the return of bottle caps as a primary form of cash in the Mojave, but we also have NCR and Legion money being available too. This continues in Fallout 4 as there is no real explanation on what these caps are backed by, but at this point, the caps have ingrained themselves into the identity of the Fallout series. The same goes for the online prequel Fallout 76. At this point, you can just assume that the caps have just become the de facto currency of the Fallout series, and no explanation is needed or given. While there is some background lore that talks about the justification of these caps, I'm speaking in this video more on a broad spectrum, a rundown more or less. A little over a year ago, obviously going by the time of this recording, I was gifted a ring in Fallout 76 by a fan. I had never seen an old ring in-game before, and I certainly had never seen a two-star legendary old ring. The stats on this are plus one to strength and 50% less falling damage. During streams, viewers told me that the ring probably wasn't a legal item. While I do have quite a few hours into Fallout 76, I don't really follow it enough to know what is possible and what is not. Regardless, I figured most people probably hadn't seen a ring like this either due to what people were saying. I thought it'd be fun to show you guys and I can't wait to read your comments on what you think about this legendary old ring. In Fallout New Vegas, the devs did a lot to ensure people were discouraged from mad dashing to the shiny beacon that is the Strip. This is why when heading through Sloan, Chomps will stop you and have this to say. Hold up. There are death claws all over the damn place north of here. 
I'd turn back if I were you. If you want to get to New Vegas, you're better off heading east from Prim and then looping north. It's a heck of a lot safer. If we come from the north, however, Chomps will have some unique dialogue and be impressed with the courier. Can't believe anyone actually made it through from the north, what with all the death claws at the quarry. You returning from New Vegas? They moved into the quarry after the powder gangers came through and made off with most of our dynamite. We shut the quarry down while we waited for the NCR to get us some more blasting sticks, but now the death claws have shown up. The NCR is a no-show, and my men and I have got nothing to do but sit on our asses all day. It's damn frustrating. Shout out to Bees from the Discord server for showing me this one. Link to the post is in the description. In Fallout New Vegas, if you have the Wild Wasteland trait, you can find this group of aliens to the north of the city. While most players go in blasting, if you remain hidden and take out just the alien captain, the other two aliens will remain non-hostile to the player. It's always nice to have some friends in the Mojave, especially when they're from out of this world. When testing Fallout New Vegas, Obsidian used a test cell NPC named Testicles the Debug Centurion. We can spawn him using console commands, and when speaking to him, we can change many things with the save file like quest outcomes, reputation levels, and even spawn Rex as a companion. Interestingly, the same model is used for Ron the narrator, who can also be seen using console commands by spawning him in or turning on player controls during the ending slideshow. Ron the narrator acts as an NPC in-game in place of Ron Perlman's VA lines. The reward for completing the Operation Anchorage DLC for Fallout 3 is access to a pre-war sealed bunker that holds relics from the period of the Resource Wars. The centerpiece is a pristine set of winterized T-51B power armor. Due to the DLC also rewarding the player with the power armor training perk required to wear the gear, this is a great way to start any playthrough, especially since the armor is indestructible, or at least it would appear that way. This is actually a misconception and a bug on Bethesda's part, leading many who played the DLC at the time of release to think that perhaps the label of winterized was a way of saying unbreakable, when in fact, that is just referring to the snowy texture. Citing the wiki, we can see the truth behind the mishap. The version given after completing the Anchorage Reclamation Simulation is the Sim version, rather than the intended Wasteland version. Among other issues, the Sim version has abnormally high health, close to 10 million hit points, and as a result, will likely never become noticeably damaged. The armor can only be repaired by merchants. The Operation Anchorage DLC in Fallout 3 sees the Brotherhood Outcast trying to access a secured bunker. Most players on repeat playthroughs hit this DLC first because of the unbreakable power armor reward. But if you happen to show up in some Outcast power armor, you will receive some unique dialogue for doing so. The Outcasts are standoffish to outsiders, but they're pretty welcoming when they think you're a part of the group. About damn time the reinforcements showed up. Fall in, soldier. We got multiple hostiles between here and the base camp. We're sweeping the area to secure it. Let's move. Nice work out there, soldier. Thanks for the backup. But where's the rest of your detachment? Ah, uh, that'd be Protector McGraw. Sir, he's... he's inside. Go ahead, Ed. Ah, thank you for responding to our distress call. All right, follow me. I'll take you to Protector McGraw. So you're the one Marill sent down. Except you're not one of us, are you? I'll have to have a little chat with Marill about that. But, you do have that computer there on your wrist. Hmm. I can see now that Marill made the right call. Maybe you can be useful after all. While filming for videos in Fallout New Vegas, I came across a really interesting bug with Victor. After siding with the town in Ghost Town gunfight, I tried to recruit Victor and then talk to him after the fight, and this is what happened. Let me know down in the comments if this has happened to you. It's a pretty crazy bug, and I just want to know if anybody else has experienced it. In Fallout New Vegas, if you find yourself inside the Lucky 38 suite, you can grab one of the rarest drinks in the whole game. For those of us who leave the room the way it is and don't think twice about the various items strewn about, we likely miss this one-of-a-kind consumable altogether. Nestled next to a ham radio and its much more common and visibly identical counterpart, a bottle of scotch, we can find this Jake juice the only item of its kind in Fallout New Vegas. According to the wiki, it's named this way to reflect a Jamaican ginger extract known as Jake. 
This medicine was used in prohibition times and often held 80% of its weight as ethanol. So, in reality, this Jake juice would knock your dick in the dirt faster than most things you could find in New Vegas. In game though, it's identical to scotch. I think it's best to leave it just where it is due to its rarity. An excellent conversation piece for Cass. As we are all familiar with in Fallout 4, we wake up in a cryogenic tube and start our Commonwealth adventure after a brief pre-war segment. The first enemies we come across are rad roaches that have infested the dank vault underground. During the fight with these bugs, we can use vats to target them more accurately. The problem with this is, we haven't picked up a Pip-Boy yet, meaning the sole survivor is capable of using vats without one. And there's a terminal in the institute that reads, In select Gen 3 units, the synthetic brain is indeed capable of accepting specific enhancements to the visual cortex, basal ganglia, and right parietal cortex. The result is substantially improved combat effectiveness due to two factors. An increased understanding of weapon accuracy to the extent that the combatant can actually visualize the percentage of effectively hitting targets, or smaller areas on those targets. And two, an altered sense of perception that mimics the effect of slowing or even stopping time. Using this info, mixed with the myriad of other hints in Fallout 4, I can safely assume the Soul Survivor is a synth replacement made to take Father's place once he passes on. Many people have said that the Courier in New Vegas can use vats before getting the Pip-Boy as well, but this is not true. The Soul Survivor is the only player character that has this ability. In Fallout 2, you can come across a giant stone head in the waste, along with a beautiful waterfall. This stone head represents the Vault Dweller from the original Fallout. Interacting with the stone head will prompt it to tell you to keep your damn hands off of it. After telling the head that you are the chosen one, an argument will ensue. That will last 12 hours. Ultimately, the head of the vault dweller will give up and accept that you are the chosen one, rewarding us with a monument chunk. The in-game description reads, This is a piece of the disgruntled stone monument you found out in the desert. Although many of your village would no doubt regard it as a sacred relic, somehow you suspect that you have been cheated. Consuming this chunk will give a plus 3 boost to strength and agility with plus 50 damage resistance as icing on the cake, but this lasts only an hour. After that time has passed, it will actually debuff the chosen one, taking 3 points from strength and agility, but this will also only last an hour. If you feel brave and have a high steal skill above 95%, you can steal 3 more of these monument chunks from the head. It won't be pretty if you fail the skill check though as the Sacred Head of the Vault Dweller deals impossible amounts of damage and will gib you instantly. This is an incredible special encounter to come across in your travels as it adds some humor from the lore of the series and it's just as outrageous as it needs to be. Fallout 2 players have a permanent wild wasteland trait due to all the wacky stuff in this game, and I love it. In Fallout 3, when doing the Wasteland Survival Guide quest, if you're wearing the Mechanist costume when you get to the robotics bit, you will actually get a bit of unique dialogue. We're in the last stretch now, so let's finish it up strong. What's first? Oh, this is so exciting! I feel like I'm sending you out on some sort of super assignment. Okay, okay, give me a moment to calm down. Now then, after some searching, I got this Robco processor widget. Supposedly, if you connect it to the mainframe at the Robco factory, you can get access to an army of robots. Seems like it's right up your alley, huh? And it'd be a great example of how to harness technology, wouldn't it? At the Topps Casino in New Vegas, we can talk to Tommy Torini inside the Aces Theater. He will ask the courier to recruit acts for the casino. The quest will lead us to the comedians Billy Knight and Hadrian, and the musicians Bruce Isaac and the Lonesome Drifter. While recruiting the boys, we can see that the marquee for the tops is starting to fill up with these names. Excellent small detail, but it also offers a hint at a bigger reward for completing the quest. We can watch these acts once they've settled at the Aces Theater. I told my wife, she's good looking for a ghoul. It's just too bad she's not a ghoul. Ay ay ay. The most interesting of which is the Lonesome Drifter, who will play reimagined folk songs that will fit into the Fallout universe, such as singing Streets of New Reno based on Streets of Laredo which was first published in 1910 in John Lomax's Cowboy Songs and Other Frontier Ballads, but was made famous by Marty Robbins. These songs were recorded by Fallout New Vegas lead Joshua Sawyer. As I walked out in the streets of New Reno, as I walked out in New Reno one day, I spied a young cowboy all wrapped in white linen 
Wrapped in white linen and cold as the clay. In Fallout New Vegas, we can find Vault 34, protected by hordes of golden geckos and mass amounts of toxic waste that seep radiation into anything nearby. Not to mention, once inside, we have the crazed vault dwellers turned ghoul and the copious levels of water that have plunged a lot of the vault into murky darkness. It's a hellscape. The NCR can point us towards this vault with the Hard Luck Blues quest, but you might want to enter the surrounding cave away from the group of geckos. If the courier comes from the north of this area, a top entrance can be found. I have seen people avoid the hole, thinking it would lead to instant death, but that is not the case. It just acts as a small shortcut to the vault that allows you to skip some geckos if you want. New Vegas has a ton of alternate entrances and exits, so if you know of any the viewers might not know about, drop a comment on the video to let us know. This one was suggested by Oblivion Walker on the Discord. In the Fallout New Vegas DLC Lonesome Road, there is an item that many people miss entirely, mainly because it looks like an object we usually wouldn't be able to loot. The Roughin' It Bedroll is perhaps one of the best items in the game. They can also fetch a pretty penny when doing some merchant runs, as you only need one bedroll and there are three throughout the divide. The first one we can find is above the entrance to the Hopeville Silo, nestled between a car and a hard place. The second one we can locate is at the Ruined Highway Interchange, leaning against a median. Then, third and finally, we can find one in a makeshift stone hut around the Ashton Silo Control Station. These bedrolls will allow you to sleep pretty much anywhere you want, meaning you can heal yourself and get some rest around Lonesome Road, which helps out quite a bit. All you have to do is select it in your Pip-Boy and catch some Zs. Not something you want to leave behind the next time you visit the Divide. In Fallout 4, we can find many birds throughout the Commonwealth. One fact to note is that some of them are synthetic, and they are watching. These watchers, as the Institute calls them, are synth animals, in this case primarily ravens, that act as security cameras throughout the Commonwealth, which the Railroad and Minutemen are well aware of. You can find display screens in the Institute that will eerily line up with some of the locations we can find birds in the wasteland. This allows the Synth Retention Bureau to monitor the outside, with most people being none the wiser. This is a tremendous small detail in Fallout 4, and it might make you do a double take the next time you see some birds out in your travels. In Fallout New Vegas, you will likely acquire the quest Come Fly With Me. In this side quest, we have to help Jason Bright and his followers get their rockets to working order to travel to the far beyond. They wish to leave the Mojave due to the ghoul bigotry in the area. Most ferals being shot on sight makes the group uneasy. Due to the use of rockets and the vague name of the Far Beyond location, many people just assumed that the Bright Brotherhood was headed to outer space in search of another planet altogether, but this is not true. This is proven by the fact that in some endings, parts of the religious group make their way back to the Mojave to rebuild and help settlers after the Second Battle of Hoover Dam, shown in slides walking across the wasteland. The more likely destination for Jason and his bunch is Dayglow, a town known for its large population and acceptance of ghouls, as well as its high residual radiation levels. Big thanks to Rocked from the Discord for suggesting this one. In Fallout New Vegas, we can find Jacobstown, a quaint little settlement outside of downtown Vegas, inhabited by Marcus and his super mutant family. On the outskirts of town, we can find Charleston Cave. This cave is a nightmare, filled to the brim with Night Stalker and enough twists and turns to get most people lost fast. Deep in the flooded chambers at the bottom of the cavern, we can find something that many explorers miss. Most people are here for the quest, guess who I saw today, and might have missed it altogether, due to the confusing tunnels here. This bunker lies hidden in one of the corners of the under chambers, and is both a nice find and a disturbing one. The shelter looks sturdy, and has held up well for over 200 years, and we can find some ammo, purified water, and some first aid kims on the rack. There's even a bed on the floor. We can also find an audio log that seems to be from the person using this bunker from around the time the bombs dropped, and it has some disturbing overtones to say the least. So the Reds finally hit us, just like I always said they would. Vegas is still there as far as I know, but that probably won't last long. Didn't get accepted into one of the vaults, so I did the next best thing and had this place built. Got massive debts, but who cares now? <laughs> That's every man for himself now. Had to take care of the Paulson boy since he knew about this place. These supplies are for me and nobody else. There's a woman and her daughter up in one of the rooms of the lodge. Might go pay him a visit tomorrow. A man's got needs. In Fallout New Vegas, we can come across a disgruntled bounty hunter named Little Buster. He will be punching his cares away at Camp McCarran with his unique unarmed weapon, the Cram Opener. Hey, yeah. Next time you see me, maybe I'll be rolling in a shitload of caps, right? Nothing is stopping you from killing him and taking it now, but if we complete the quest 3 card bounty and take out the fiends listed, 
Little Buster will be gone from the area. Turns out, the next time we see him, he isn't rolling in caps, he's actually dead outside the old Mormon fort, laying on the train tracks. Of course, we can loot the cram opener from him here, but some may miss this opportunity because it's such a poorly trafficked area. Regardless, it's nice that Obsidian tied his little story together, even if it didn't turn out so well. Northwest of the 188 trading post lies the Followers Outpost, which, as the name would imply, is an outpost for the followers of the apocalypse in Fallout New Vegas. On the outside, this looks like any standard quaint railway tower. But on the inside, we can see that the followers really made use of their space. The ceiling is much higher than the outside would lead you to believe. The overall room available is far more than what is represented by the tower itself. This is probably more common than we think, so if you know of any more buildings like this, hit the comments and let everyone know. Since Fallout 3, we have been hearing bits and pieces that would eventually lead us to Fallout 76, mainly in the mentioning of Vault 76. In the A-Ring of the Citadel in Fallout 3, we can find this terminal entry about the Vault. It covers the various equipment that was issued to the Vault and gives this description. Vault 76 is one of our 17 control vaults. It will operate exactly according to the plan dictated in the marketing material produced by vault Tech and precisely to resident expectations. This vault will open automatically after a period of 20 years and the residents will be pushed back into the open world for study in comparison to the other experiments. In the DLC for Fallout 3, Mothership Zeta, we can hear an audio log from an assistant CEO of vault Tech Corporation named Giles Wollstonecroft. He is abducted while inspecting the Vault 76 site. Hey now, no reason to get yourselves worked up. Whatever you need, I'm going to tell it to you. Well, I'm pretty sure you want me to talk into this thing, so here goes. My name is Giles Wollstonecroft. I'm the current Assistant Chief Executive Officer of the Vault Tech Corporation. I was inspecting the construction site of Vault 76 when I was captured. What I can only assume are alien beings from another world. I'm not sure what they want from me or what they will do to me, but whatever they need, I will readily provide. Perhaps... If I can bridge our communication gap and establish a rapport with them, we can enter into an exclusive trade agreement. In fact, instead of talking to this damn machine, I'm going to attempt to address them directly. On behalf of the vault -Tec Corporation, I'd like to extend a heartfelt welcome to you. Wait, you don't need that. Wait! What? In Fallout 4, the newscaster at the beginning of the game, who's voiced by Ron Perlman, will mention the opening of Vault 76 before the bombs drop. vault stock continues to rise as tensions with China reach an all-time high. With the world poised on the brink of war, vault is reporting a record number of reservations in vaults around the country. vault announced a continuation of their popular Welcome Home promotion. They report openings are still available in Area Vaults 81, 111, and 114. Since debuting Vault 76 last year, in honor of America's tercentenary, vault Tech continues to expand with plans for well over 100 vaults around the country. In Fallout 2, the Chosen One can get a quest to rescue Smiley, the Trapper, from the Toxic Caves. After finding him, one might notice the generator and elevator nearby. This is pretty much impossible to get into in the early game, as you need good repair or Vic as a companion to do the repairs for you, and you need to be skilled at lockpicking. Well, the skill won't get you far here, as you also need an electronic lockpick, which can be found in places like San Francisco and Navarro. A prepared chosen one could manage to get through the elevator. Still, they will be met with a security bot, also known as a sentry bot, on the lower level, which will, of course, be hostile. This is not the only sentry bot in the game, but it comes out of nowhere to stop you from going any further. More of these guys can be found at the Sierra Army Depot or the oil rig, implying the Enclave likes to use them. If we manage to win this fight, the reward is arguably one of the best weapons in the game, the Bozar Rifle, which can blow away Deathclaws in one burst. In the game files for Fallout 3, there's a set of power armor that really stands out above the rest. This absolute beauty of a set of armor is commonly referred to as the Heartbreaker Power Armor. It is all pink, including the helmet, and it is emblazoned with a white heart on the chest. Interestingly, it also features the Brotherhood of Steel markings on the shoulders. I couldn't find what the original plan for this armor was. Still, the developers of Fallout 3 decided to cut this PA set before the final game was released. This has to be my favorite cut armor in the Fallout series. Vault Boy is the lovable mascot, for lack of a better term, of the Fallout series. 
Always the fan favorite, Vault Boy is featured in every Fallout game as a way to illustrate the different perks, skills, quests, and pretty much anything else that could be found in the Pip-Boy, as well as a pre-war icon for Vault Tech. This video is about the spicier side of the blue suit wonder, as we will be looking at the more controversial appearances of Vault Boy and his Vault Girl counterpart. First, let's take a look at the Child Killer Reputation title in the classic Fallout games. The player would get this title obviously after killing a child in combat. This depiction of Vault Boy running from a mob dressed as a dastardly villain was used in the skill decks, the same image used for the Hated Reputation. For Fallout 2, an updated image was considered that saw Vault Boy kicking a pregnant Vault Girl with the word baby written on her shirt. This image was ultimately cut from the game, and Brian Menz, the artist behind the picture, had this to say. This image was unused and the only Vault Boy image to ever be cut from Fallout 2. I'm sure you can figure out why. I remember when I got the request to do the perk illustration for Child Killer that there would be no way to keep it from being offensive. I mean, really, how do you make an illustration of Child Killer and keep it from being offensive? Anyway, for some reason, I thought this was the least offensive way to do it. I have no idea what I was thinking. Even the designer who requested it realized it was a bad idea, so we fixed it. Looking back on it now, I can't believe I drew this. Another version of Vault Boy we would never see in today's Fallout landscape is the classic Fallout version of the Kim Reliant trade, which depicts Vault Boy tied off and hunched over, looking much like a heroin overdose scene. This seems to be the case, as the trade itself does not appear past Fallout tactics. Vault Boy is no stranger to adult overtones either. Suppose the Chosen One has a great rating after a sexual encounter or just sleeps with a few people. In that case, they will be granted the Gigolo Reputation title, which has one of my personal favorite versions of Vault Boy. If the Chosen One has 10 sexual encounters, it will unlock the Sexpert Reputation title, which shows Vault Boy and Vault Girl in bed with some notches on the headboard. Kama Sutra Master shows a similar scene that reflects the perk's name, with Vault Boy and Vault Girl tied up in a precarious position. These are relatively tame, but you won't be seeing them in any of the new Fallout titles. Still, they only get more provocative from there. The Porn Star Reputation title, unlocked in New Reno by acting in one of the Golden Globes films, shows Vault Boy getting some treatment from three Vault Girls in revealing underwear. Certainly not the Vault Boy we know these days. Finally, the lewdest of the Vault Boy artwork, the cut version of the Waste Reputation title. The Chosen One would begin with this reputation and only lose it by sleeping with an NPC. While this was ultimately cut, this title can still be added through a save editor. Fallout New Vegas follows the events of the Mojave after the courier is shot and left for dead in Good Springs. The bulk of the game is about deciding the fate of the Mojave by taking one of four paths. The courier can side with major factions during the upcoming battle at Hoover Dam, such as the NCR and the Legion, or they can fulfill the dreams of Mr. House by securing New Vegas under his guise. The possibility of taking matters into their own hands even exists through Yes Man. Some New Vegas players may not know that there is a hidden ending buried under a few requirements that sees the Courier and Father Elijah take the Mojave. Before starting the Dead Money DLC, this can happen if the Courier is vilified by the NCR and has recruited Veronica as a companion. Of course, making sure to ask her all about Father Elijah. I would say he was my tutor, but that doesn't cover it. After my parents passed, he looked after me. The whole brotherhood brought me up, really, but he made sure of it. I never had a grandfather, not that I knew anyway, but Elijah was in some ways what I'd imagined a grandfather to be. Now, you would have to take on the task of going through the Dead Money DLC. It doesn't matter who lives or dies by the end. Once you're at the Sierra Madre Vault, talk to Elijah about Veronica. Veronica? She survived Helios? She would. Resourceful. Elijah will then express his desire for the Mojave, and since we're vilified by the NCR, we can agree with him. Now, we get the most hidden ending slide in New Vegas. <sighs> Perhaps. Perhaps I was too quick to put a collar on a potential ally. Very well. I'll come down and show you what the Sierra Madre has in store. In the years that followed, the legend of the Sierra Madre faded, and there were no new visitors to the city. Years later, when a mysterious blood-red cloud began to roll across the Mojave, then west toward the Republic, no one knew where it had come from. Only that it brought death in its wake. Attempts to find the source of the toxic cloud failed. The Mojave was cut off. Through the cloud, lights were seen from Helios 1. There were stories of ghosts immune to gunfire who struck down anyone they saw with rays of light. 
The last chapter of the Mojave came when a modified Repcon rocket struck Hoover Dam, releasing a blood-red cloud, killing all stationed there. All attempts to penetrate the cloud and retake the dam failed, and both the NCR and Legion finally turned away from it, citing the place as cursed. Only two remained alive in the depths of the cloud at the Sierra Madre, waiting for their new world to begin again. In Fallout 2, you can come across my favorite encounter in the entire series, the Guardian of Forever. When first arriving at the special encounter, it may just look like some ruins, but if you're to walk through the Ark, you will take a trip through space and time. On the other side, the Chosen One will find themselves inside Vault 13, but not the Vault 13 that appears in Fallout 2. This is Vault 13 from before the events of the original Fallout. You're able to explore this level of the vault, but there's no NPCs to interact with. The Chosen One can loot a bunch of Vault 13 water flasks and even some weapons they may find in the locker. And also, don't forget about the Solar Scorcher that lies on the floor here. There's one terminal inside the mainframe of the vault that seems to be making noise, and if you interact with it, that's when the fun really starts. It seems the Chosen One pressed too many buttons or didn't exactly know what they were doing because upon messing with the computer, it breaks the water chip for Vault 13, putting into effect the events of Fallout 1, which in the log says gives you some kind of strange comfort. The core of this encounter is a reference to the city on the edge of forever, which is a Star Trek episode that saw Kirk and Spock take a similar portal named the Guardian of Forever to New York in the 1920s. In the Fallout series, there's a lot of things to do. The game worlds are filled with side quests and interesting characters that can easily take hundreds of hours of your time. One of the often overlooked activities that players can do in most Fallout games is a pastime that goes back generations. I am, of course, talking about cow tipping or Brahmin tipping for the post-war folks. In the original Fallout, this act was done by using beer on the Brahmin, getting them drunk, causing them to tip over. A lot of players miss this because very few would think to use beer on a Brahmin. In Fallout 2, this was simplified with the introduction of the push command. Usually this action would move human NPCs out of the player's way. Still, when used on a Brahmin, it tips them over, keeping the tradition alive. In Fallout Tactics, your squad can come across a special encounter that hosts a large area of fenced-in Brahmin. It even includes a sign that says, do not tip the Brahmin. If the warrior or any of their squad members interact with the Brahmin, it will cause them to tip over. Plenty of cows for the tipping here. As the Fallout series entered the first-person era with Bethesda, this tradition came with it. If you are crouched next to a Brahmin in Fallout 3, you can tip them over with a great push animation, essentially making the cows go ragdoll, which can be great fun. This carries over to New Vegas as well, where the same tactics can be used on the Brahmin of the Mojave. This only works on normal Brahmin, so you won't be pushing any pack Brahmin down during caravan runs. This feature was mysteriously left out of Fallout 4, though there are mods that claim to add the cow tipping tradition into the game. Regardless, this has to be the most underrated pastime in the Fallout series. This has been suggested by quite a few people, but most recently, the Pro Game Freak on Discord. In the Fallout New Vegas DLC Lonesome Road, we can find an extremely rare item. In fact, this is the only time that we can find this at all. After exiting the Hopeville silo, if we head to the back of the Solitaire gas station, we have a 1 in 10 chance of a Nuka-Cola Quantum spawning in this crate. If you miss it, you miss it. You would have to reload a save before you leave the silo in order to reroll the contents of this crate. This is the only Nuka-Cola Quantum in the entire game, so if you're a collector of rare items, this will be a must-grab for you on every playthrough. If you manage to get the Sheriff's Duster in Fallout New Vegas, you'll notice that it's the same Sheriff's Duster that Lucas Sims had in Fallout 3, down to the Sheriff's Star, which even says Megaton. Now, this could be a Fallout 3 reference, but that's highly unlikely. Odds are it's just an oversight and a reused asset. Boy, I really hope somebody got fired for that blunder. In the classic Fallout games, you will come across NPCs that have talking heads. This term refers to NPCs you interact with that have a voice dialogue and a first-person conversation box. What some fans may not know is that these heads are made from clay, after which they are edited through various programs and saved in sync with the voice lines of each character. This practical effect is another great way the Fallout devs visually made the game stand out and add certain vibes to the classic NPCs that haven't been matched since. I would love to get my hands on one of these old sculptures for my Fallout collection. What a fantastic piece. In the Fallout 3 add-on Broken Steel, we can find what I would call the worst hidden weapon, though this launcher was never supposed to be obtained anyways. After heading to the Rockland Tunnel and clashing with the Enclave, you can find this fence between two stone posts. This is where you can get this weapon legitimately by using 5mm ammo boxes to build a set of stairs. On PC, we can simply no-clip through and head to the location of the Tesla Cannon Beta. 
This Tesla cannon uses the same model as the missile launcher and also takes missiles as ammo. This means it can be repaired with missile launchers. While it may look like a standard missile launcher, it will fire the standard Tesla cannon shot. I call this the worst hidden weapon almost as a meme as it does less damage than its in-game counterpart and uses more AP. While in New Vegas, if you visit Vault 22 and you go inside Sarah's room, you will be able to see a portrait of James and Catherine from Fallout 3, the Lone Wanderer's parents. Now this is either a Fallout 3 Easter egg for some reason, because of the Vault Tech connection, or this is just a photo reuse asset situation. Either way, it is an interesting discussion piece. In Fallout 2, you can come across a special encounter called a Crash Shuttle with the world map circle calling it Federation Shuttle. And laying outside the craft, we can find a bunch of dead red shirts. Of course, this special encounter is a big reference to the Star Trek franchise, with the design of the shuttle being pretty much identical to those we see on the USS Enterprise from the original series. The red shirts that we see here are also modeled after the ones that we see in Star Trek. Of course, these are the people who have the most unfortunate luck in the entire series and always end up dying in some horrible way. This encounter also holds a reference that's more personal to the development of Fallout 2, with the name of the craft and the starship that it originated from being a reference to Adani Torres, who was an intern artist that worked on Fallout 2. We can find futuristic looking hypodermic needles on the red shirts. These, in game, can heal 75 to 100 HP. They're pretty good. The chosen one was supposed to be able to find a phaser here at this encounter, but that was unfortunately cut. It would have acted as a high power energy pistol. In Fallout New Vegas, just southeast of Horowitz Farm, lies a house that kind of breaks the norm. This house is open, meaning that there's no load screen required when going in and out. I have played a lot of Fallout New Vegas, and this is the only house fully built inside that seems to be this way. Of course, if you have found others, please let me know in the comments. Guarded by two fiends, the house is a nice resting area for anyone who can clear them out. While there are ruins throughout the Mojave that have a similar feel, I haven't found a complete house that is just open in the wasteland like this. In Fallout 3, you're supposed to assume that Colonel Autumn dies during the Project Purity incident when he confronts James. Of course, he shows that he has survived after the player finds the Gek. Many people have asked how Colonel Autumn could have survived such an event, and I myself didn't really know until a couple of years ago. Turns out that Colonel Autumn pulls out a syringe and injects himself with some kind of mystery agent. According to the wiki, it is probably a more effective version of Radaway or Radex. In Fallout 3, if you travel to Fordham Flash Memorial Field, you can find a raider that seems to be carrying on the Great American Pastime. If you remain undetected, you will see this raider running the bases. While the rest of their group is out on patrol, this baseball enthusiast has taken it to the next level and will continue this animation until they see you or they are killed. I like to think that all the Kims are finally starting to get to the raiders' heads when I see something like this. The Fallout series is filled with exciting locations. Pretty much every game in the lineup has at least one place that stands out for one reason or another, and I want to talk about two that are my favorite. A surprising amount of people seem to miss what's going on with the names of these places. First, Arafu in Fallout 3. This settlement is named this way because of the sign on the overpass. It read, careful, next exit, pre-war. And since then, the first and last letter rubbed off, leading to the locals calling it Arafu. A very similar thing is going on with Novak in Fallout New Vegas, though it is hinted at much stronger because we can still see the lettering from before. In front of the hotel, the no vacancy sign lost most of its letters, so the locals referred to the area as Novak. Do you have a favorite city name in the Fallout series? I would love to see more examples of this clever naming pattern, so let me know in the comments below. In the Fallout New Vegas DLC Lonesome Road, we travel to the Divide and learn a lot about ourselves along the way. One thing about Lonesome Road that gets overlooked quite often is the fact that Ulysses, the courier we meet here, watches us from the jump. In at least two locations, we can see this for ourselves. Though I have heard rumors of other places to spot Ulysses, these are the two I can confirm. First, we can see Ulysses while heading towards the crow's nest. He will be overlooking the broken highway and staring a hole through us while doing so. The second time we can see him is by the Sunstone Tower. After he speaks through Eddie, we can see him walking off in the distance. This is an incredibly cool small detail that really drives the character of Ulysses home. If you know for sure of any other places we can spot him, let me know on Discord in the video suggestions with a screenshot or something like that, and I will update the video. As far as I know, these are the only two locations to see him. Howdy, partner! Might I say you're looking fit as a fiddle? In Fallout New Vegas, we meet Victor, the lovable cowboy-themed Securitron that resides in Good Springs. I want to talk about a couple of things that it seems some players miss due to the way the game is laid out. Victor digs the courier out of their shallow grave, and we wake up in Doc's bed. After leaving Doc Mitchell's house, he's the first NPC we come across, so naturally, he is usually the first person we talk to outside of the dock. 
During the first real quest that shows itself to us, Ghost Town Gunfight, we are tasked with mustering up as many townsfolk as possible for the upcoming raid from the Powder Gangers. Everyone involved with the quest is marked except for Victor himself. The first bit of unique dialogue happens here where we can recruit Victor for the battle. Trouble with rustlers, huh? Count me in, partner. Those varmints will be running home with their tails between their legs soon enough. Victor will no-show the fight, so catching up with him after, we can use a science skill check to reveal that an override was issued remotely in his programming. Howdy, partner! So when do the rustlers show up? Really? I must have dozed off. Although that's never happened before. Alright, but put everything back the way you found it. Override? That can't be right. Probably just a malfunctioning tube somewhere. I truly am sorry I couldn't help you, partner. Was there something else you wanted to talk about? Now, the other bit of Victor's unique dialogue comes from not speaking to him until you hit New Vegas, where he will give you a fabulous introduction. Howdy, partner! You come for a piece, haven't you? Welcome to New Vegas! Allow me to introduce myself. I'm the Securitron that dug you up in the bone orchard outside Good Springs. I thought you'd gone up the flume, but that Doc Mitchell knows his trade. It's good to see you up and around, right as a trivet. Consider me your personal welcome wagon. Now hear this. The head honcho of New Vegas, Mr. House, is itching to make your acquaintance. Just head for the Lucky 38. It's the big old tower shaped like a roulette spinner. Yeah, partner! That's the spirit. He'll be waiting for you. I love the attention to things like this in New Vegas. It's quite the reward for players that don't really follow the beaten path. In Fallout 2, you can encounter aliens out in the wasteland during your travels. They are intense and brutal, but they are not extraterrestrial. Outside of Redding, you will only see them as aliens. Still, when exploring the underground mines of the town, you will see they have changed to their proper name, Wanamingo. Fallout 2 does this because most everyone in the game world knows these creatures as aliens, so the Chosen One would only have that as a reference, making them appear as aliens in the logs. But in the minds of Redding, people know them for what they are, so it has changed to represent that. Wanamingos were made using FEV for fighting wars against other countries. In the Old World Blues DLC for Fallout New Vegas, we can explore Big Mountain. The location is one of the most advanced in the Fallout universe. It holds many surprises, secrets, and exciting characters in its midst. One of my Discord members pointed out that we can find a dead followers doctor on the sink roof. The overwhelming amount of technology and scientific experiments could be why we see this poor follower here. The followers are passionate about many forms of research, including human longevity, which could be what brought this cursed soul to their doom. You can actually get to this doctor and loot him by expertly jumping up the ramps by the entrance. On his corpse, you can find a doctor's coat, a super stim pack, and a few regular stim packs. Still, the most interesting thing about this person is wondering just what brought them here and how they met their end. My best guess is they were trying to find a way into the sink but got stopped fast by the advanced security measures. Or got shot by a lobotomite. A cruel fate. I received a question from a viewer that I hadn't really thought about before, and that was, do the boomers at Nellis fire on every NPC that enters their territory, or is it just Janet and the courier that are victims to their artillery shots? Well, the answer is they absolutely do, but they seem to show mercy to NCR veteran rangers. Thank <laughs> you. 
In Fallout New Vegas, we can meet Daisy Whitman and Novak. She is an old pilot that isn't too open about her past, though we can get her to open up about a crash she had over Klamath. Vertebird pilot. 71 missions and only lost one chopper. Rotor malfunction over Klamath. Hard landing, but I walked away. You can find this crash in Fallout 2, as it features Klamath. If you can make it past the robot, we can see that Daisy is lucky to be alive, as a couple of her faction mates weren't so fortunate. Everyone who has played Fallout New Vegas knows that gambling is a fun feature to be found at the casinos on the Strip. In fact, there is even an achievement for reaching the max winnings at all three of the major casinos in New Vegas proper. From what I have seen, many people seem to be unaware that you can gamble and get banned from lesser venues. While most people know that the Atomic Wrangler hosts games, it's when we come to the Vicky and Vance Casino in Prim that most players seem to be in the dark. This is likely because of how long of a process it is for the Vicky and Vance to open this feature to the courier. First, one would have to clear Prim of the convicts. Then, finishing the quest My Kind of Town would be a great next step. After a few days in game, a gang of NCR deserters will show up as an encounter in the casino. After dispatching them, you would still have to pass another few days in game before Vicky and Vance start to take your business. Due to this long process of revisiting Prim, most players never see that you can gamble here, as usually people stop going back to Prim after My Kind of Town is complete. So get out there and make that bread. In Fallout 3, Megaton will likely be the first settlement you come across after leaving Vault 101 a quaint, walled-in town made from old airplane scrap built around an active atom bomb. One of the critical stops while looking for your dad out in the capital wasteland is speaking to Colin Moriarty. He runs the aptly named Moriarty Saloon. Inside the saloon, we can meet one of the most likable characters in Fallout 3, Gob, a timid, frequently abused ghoul who works the bar and only wants to listen to Galaxy News Radio while he does it. If the Lone Wanderer somehow kills Moriarty, an interesting thing will happen with the saloon itself. Gob will take over the bar and even change the sign after a while to represent that he is calling the shots now. Nothing else really changes after this besides Nova giving up on the world's oldest profession to run the hotel. However, it is still a nice touch to showcase the player's decisions throughout the game. If your sneak skill in Fallout New Vegas is over 60, you will be able to sneak up on Ghost and get this unique bit of dialogue. Hmm. Huh. Didn't even hear you come up the ramp. You don't broadcast your movements. I like that. You a courier? If so, this might be your lucky day. If you don't mind walking a bit. And your eyes are good. In Fallout 4, you can encounter a guy named Parker Quinn, and he is selling something called a charge card. Similar to a credit card in the pre-war, these cards would issue debts to the users with late fees if the cards were not paid off monthly. The charge card? That's what I said, charge card. It's super simple. You give me 110 caps right now, and I give you this charge card. Accept it at any store in the Commonwealth, up to 100 caps. The 10 extra caps is my service fee. So what do you say, want one? Sounds good, I'll take one. Awesome, I'll take your money and you get the charge card. Great doing business with you. Tell your friends, Parker Quinn, same Connor every day. Retard. This is not the only way to get one of these cards, though. One can be found in an open dumpster at Fort Strong, Deb at Bunker Hill has a chance to have one, and level 4 trading stands have a chance to sell them. Still, merchants in the Commonwealth want nothing to do with it. Do you take this charge card? A charge card? I'm sorry, but I'm programmed to only accept what you humans call caps. Can I use this charge card here? Is this something synths used to pay for things? We don't take filthy synth money here. You take this charge card? Trying to pull a fast one on me? No. Caps only. Can I pay with my charge card? You're kidding, right? Caps only, friend. Do you take this charge card? Uh, caps only, I'm afraid. Can I put this on my charge card? Hey. <laughs> I know money's kind of an imaginary thing anyway, but that card is like way more imaginary than I'm comfortable with. Can I pay with my charge card? Whatever that is, we don't take it. But on the island of Far Harbor, one merchant, Brooks, actually will accept the card. Hey, this is a long shot, but um, do you accept this charge card? Huh? Oh yeah, that thing. Sure do. It'll be easier if I just cash you out. Looks like, what, 100 caps? Here you go. Many fans in the Fallout community are having a fit right now, claiming they have a Mandela effect when it comes to a moment in the pit, the DLC for Fallout 3. People claim that you could eat Marie, the baby that has immunity to radiation, of course if the player has bad karma and the cannibal perk, resulting in the Lone Wanderer being 100% resistant to radiation. 
This was never the case. It's actually a mod called Acquired Immunity. Just wanted to clear this up, and a link to the mod will be in the description below. If you head to the Junkyard in the Nuka World DLC for Fallout 4, you can find this Porter Diner. Your past experiences might cause you to walk by every Porter Diner you see because you never feel like you're going to get the pie. But this one is different. It has a 100% chance of giving you the perfectly preserved pie. Now, you can find some laying around the wasteland, but this one is guaranteed fresh. So whenever you have that itch for a little pre-war snack, now you know where to find it. While playing Fallout New Vegas, you may hear some crazy sounds that you can't quite place. These electronic, static-filled noises sometimes sound like a distorted scream. They often confused me through my playthroughs, but recently I've discovered the source of these noises. The first one is easy to identify, a glitchy sounding slide guitar track. We can track this down to the Hawaiian hula girl found in many places throughout the wasteland. It's a shame we can't collect these, as it'd be fun to hoard all the hula girls in the game. The second noise that escaped me for quite some time actually comes from a pretty obvious source. The distorted scream, or roar, is generated by the dino toys that litter the Mojave. For years I thought my game was haunted when I would hear this dino noise until I finally figured out where it was coming from. Good to know it wasn't just some spooky glitch. Get fucked. Yeah. You gon' 